It's actually the title of one of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's books. So don't credit me with that title. Um, but how do we see ourselves as we really are? <laughs> well, it's an interesting thing to start out at asking ourselves, how do we see ourselves right now? Because we often think that we see ourselves as we really are. Almost. Kind of. <laughs> because uh, if somebody asked uh, you, you know, who are you, then we would have a lot of identities to be able to list off, wouldn't we? I'm this and such nationality, you know, this is my name, this is my family. Live in Missoula or wherever you live. I'm this race. I'm this uh, religion. I'm this socioeconomic group. I'm this uh, educational group. I'm this gender. I'm this sexual orientation. I'm this career and profession. I'm this age. I'm this state of health. You know, we can go on and on and on telling people who we are, can't we? Yeah. And we have a very strong feeling of a real I, a real me, that's based on that. And a very strong feeling of who we are. I'm this person who likes this, and I don't like that. You know? And if you want to be my friend, you better do this. And you better not do that. Yeah, do you think? That kind of describe you, you know? But we're not opinionated. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but we certainly seem to have a pretty rigid, uh, or at least a multifaceted identity of who we think we are. And then we expect everybody to treat us according to who we think we are. Now, just can you think of anybody who treats you exactly the way you would like to be treated? Exactly. All the time. Can you think of anybody? All the time? My dog. <laughs> Your dog? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, you know, because we have all these identities and, you know, how we think we should be treated and our particular mood, you know, which other people are supposed to know and tune into and treat us accordingly without us saying anything to them. Right, yeah. Yeah. and uh, and it's very difficult to actually find uh, anybody who treats us the way we think we should be treated and the way we want to be treated, and so we wind up being very easily offended. Yeah. It's kind of like, do you remember going to the high school prom? <laughs> I don't know why this popped into my mind. Um, <laughs> you remember going to high school prom? And uh, no, you don't. Oh boy, I missed something. <laughs> A lot of suffering is what you missed. <laughs> okay, but for those of us who experience that suffering, um, you know, you get all decked out, and then you expect your date to say how good you look, whether you're a man or a woman. And they don't always do that. Yeah. And so then we're just devastated. Okay. So th this is something that, you know, it happens when we're teenagers, and it, it just keeps on happening throughout our life. You know, I am this and such a person, and people should treat me in this and such a way. And they don't. And so we get very easily offended. And then, of course, we get angry because we're offended. And then we get judgmental because, wow, if they're going to treat me this way, then I need to stick up for myself by judging them even harder than they've judged me. And that makes us terrifically happy, doesn't it? 
Some judging people. <laughs> How does it make you feel? How does it make you feel? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a double-edged sword. On one hand, it makes us feel crummy. In another hand, it's like, well, if they're all lousy, I must be pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Funny kind of mind, judging people. Anyway, you know, this, this whole thing is that we cling on to an identity because we think we know who we are. But those identities that we cling on to are not who we are. Yeah. And those identities that we cling on to are things that come about due to societal labels. Okay. So for example, just let's take our nationality good time prior to election. Yeah, everybody feel very American? Yeah. Or if you're not American, then you feel what, whatever nationality you are, but you want the Americans to behave in a certain way. <laughs> <laughs> These beep, beep, beep Americans, they better elect. I won't say who, because I'm not supposed to. <laughs> but a lot of preachers do. <laughs> um, okay, so we have this idea, you know, I'm American, therefore. And we have a whole bunch of associations, or whatever nationality you are, you know, I'm that nationality, therefore. And we have an image of how people should treat us. And if you travel in other countries, um, you can, because I've lived in a lot of other countries, it's very easy to pick Americans out. Yeah. Yeah. We, we stick out because we want to be treated in a certain way because we feel I am American. But what is it that makes us American? Okay. If you ask yourself, you know, we have this American identity, which you really feel very much when you're in a foreign country. Yeah, you don't feel it when you're in the majority, but when you're in the minority, then, you know, you feel that identity more acutely. But what is it that makes us American? Is your mind American? Do you have an American mind? You do? Where's your mind? Your mind American? How about your brain? Because mind is a little bit a sticky thing, <laughs> or unsticky thing. How about your brain? Is your brain American? <clears throat> Do you have an American brain? Is your body American? Attitude. Your attitude's American. What is an attitude? Are all of our attitudes American? What is an American attitude anyway? <laughs> I know John McCain and Sarah Palin have an idea <laughs> because there's us and them. The real Americans. <laughs> and then the other people. It's really a pity that am I better not? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, what is it that makes us American? You know, is our body American? Made in America? <laughs> Are we made in America? Yeah. When, when you really look at it, you know, we're only American because we have an American ID. 
isn't it? It's not the only way that you can say you're American is because there's a piece of paper that says that. Or if you're, you know, whatever other nationality. Or only that nationality because there's a piece of paper that says that. And what validity does this piece of paper have? Yeah, why does this piece of paper have any validity? Because it's only a piece of paper. I mean, this is a piece of paper. It only, you know, that that passport or ID card or whatever it, whatever you have only has validity because all of us together, you know, throughout the world, all the human beings have agreed that a certain piece of paper that looks in a certain way, you know, and states a certain word on it means that you're a citizen of a certain country. That's the only way we become American. Or whatever you are. Isn't it? Just because there's a piece of paper. Because without that piece of paper, if you were lost in the world, without your passport, yeah, could you prove you're American? <laughs> That's where attitude comes in. <laughs> <laughs> but again, what's the American attitude? Yeah. Shall I say what I didn't say before? <laughs> or not. Um. <laughs> So it's quite interesting, you know, to ask ourselves, sometimes with these identities that we hold on to very strongly, what is it that gives me that identity? Okay. Yeah. And so, for example, even with our, with our um, sex, whether you're male or you're female, okay, on what basis do we say that? Again, is your mind male or female? Our mind doesn't have form. Our mind is, isn't atomic in nature. Isn't it? Aren't we male or female based on the body? Yeah. And more specifically, just based on a certain accumulation of atoms and molecules in a certain fashion. And then that makes us male or female. That's all. That's all. You know, there's no male mind or female mind. Well, some people might get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, but you think about it. And yet we can make such a, an identity out of what sex we are, male or female. And yet it's just depending on the accumulation of atoms and molecules in a certain form. Yeah. And that just has to do with our body. And are we our body? Are you your body? You're not your body? <coughs> Who are you then? Yeah. We feel very certain. You know, I am this body. And you know, and we make a lot of identities. In fact, most of those identities, you know, that I listed, so many of them were based on our body. And yet thinking that we know who we are based on that. Like we say young and old. And is it that, again, labels that depend on the body? Is your mind young or old? Are you going to tell me your attitudes are young or old? Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, again, young and old, again, is just something based on the body. And the body is something that's constantly changing, isn't it? So how can we form a really solid identity based on the body if the body is constantly changing? That means our identity is constantly changing. But we're trying to cling on to an identity that doesn't change. And that actually is the source of a lot of suffering. 
Okay. So that's just a little bit by way to, to stimulate a little bit of doubt in the mind, you know? Because I think to uh, stimulate some questioning in the mind, you know, the questioning, am I who I think I am? I think that's very healthy. Yeah. It's, very, it's funny, in Western culture, we're usually trying to figure out who we are. In Buddhism, we're trying to figure out who we aren't. <laughs> okay? Because we already have so many ideas of who we are. Don't we? Don't we have so many, many, many ideas of who we are? All we have to do is open our mouth and all of our ideas of who we are just come pouring out. Yeah. Because what do we talk about? What's, you know, with other people, what's our favorite topic of conversation? Ourselves. <laughs> Isn't it? You know, me, I, my, and mine. That's my favorite topic of conversation. And so we think we know who we are and you know we can talk to anybody and offer an opinion about anything you know we talk about clocks well I like small clocks like this you know so my identity is a person who likes small clocks with easily read numbers you know? but you may be a person who says small clocks with easily read numbers <laughs> That's too blase, you know. I like Swiss clocks where they ring at the hour and, you know, the little figurines come out and <laughs> chant. And, and my parents have a clock like that. And, <laughs> you know, I am a person who likes that kind of clock. So we're establishing an identity, aren't we? And so we talk with people about what kind of food we like, what kind of music we like, what we like to do on our holiday, what kind of career we have, what we think is uh, beautiful, what uh, movies and TV programs we like or don't like. Okay. So we have a ton of opinions, and all of these help shape what we create as an identity. I'm the person who likes or doesn't like this or that. And even the, in this election year, I somehow can't keep myself away from this topic, <laughs> can I? Um, <laughs> we're creating a lot of identities, aren't we? You know, I'm Republican, I'm Democrat, I'm a real American. They're other. I'm Joe the Plumber. <laughs> I'm Children the Nun. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants to know what children the nun thinks. <laughs> they like Joe the plumber. I think that's unfair. <laughs> yeah. So, don't you feel that way a lot? You know, they should listen to me. Forget Joe the plumber. Do you know who he has? He has a manager now. <laughs> really? He has a manager? Because they think that he can really be somebody in TV or movie or do inspirational <laughs> talks or <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we all have an identity. I'm, you know, Susan the bookkeeper, or I'm, you know, Sally the doctor, or I'm, you know, Sam the, the mechanic. Whatever it is, you know, we have an identity. And we think that that's who we are. Oh, we're not. Yeah, we're not. And and so holding on to that identity, identity can be very, very painful. Because if people don't treat us according to how we think we should be treated according to that identity, then we get very upset. Okay. But the identity is something that we have created. And having created it, we forgot we created it, and we think we are it. And so we might create 
all sorts of other identities. I am a sick person. Yeah, we can get a lot of mileage out of that identity. I am an abused person. Get even more mileage out of that. Okay? So we can, you know, all sorts of things that happened in the past, we can hang on to them, create identities. I'm the person who was neglected by fill in the blank. And I'm sure we all can. Because we all hold an identity of I've been neglected because people don't appreciate me as much as I think I should be appreciated. Do they? Are you appreciated as much as you think you should be? Anybody here have enough appreciation? You <laughs> do. It's good. <laughs> but listen closely to what you say and see if you complain ever. <laughs> yeah? Most of us complain that, that others don't appreciate us quite as much as they should. Right? Quite in exactly the way they should. And so, all these identities. So, like I said, in, in usual uh, context, People are trying to find out who they are. In Buddhism, we're trying to tear down these identities, okay, and stop clinging to them because they can create re a tremendous amount of suffering in our lives. And they can, instead of bringing us closer to other people, make it more difficult for us to connect. Because the more we divide ourselves into different categories, then the more we think that we are inherently different from everybody else. And thus, the more fuel comes to the idea of, I've got to protect myself, because I'm unique. You following what I'm saying? No? So we kind of create the identities, cling on to them and create suffering. So let's say I have an identity. I'm saying this now because I'm, I'm reading a, a book about uh, an autobiography of somebody, and this person in, in the book clearly has the identity of I'm somebody who was abandoned as a child. Yeah. And the whole book, page after page after page in this autobiography, is establishing and proving that identity. Okay. So we all may have different identities. Yeah. But it's kind of as if, uh, you know, the, there's, there's so much attachment in the case of this book to I'm a person who was abandoned as a child that he can't see how many people cared for him. Yeah? And uh, I look at this person, and it's clear that quite a number of people actually cared for him and cared about him. But he's so stuck in his identity of I was abandoned that he can't see it. So that's the kind of thing I mean when I say that we create an identity and then we get stuck in that and it creates suffering. Or let's say, uh, okay, I'm not, but let's say I was a very great musician. Okay, so I'm a spectacular musician. Everybody should know that about me and treat me accordingly. Now, is everybody going to know that I'm a spectacular musician? No. And even those who did, are they all going to like my music? No. Are they all going to treat me the way I think I should be treated? No. So then I'm going to be pretty miserable. Because any time I go somewhere, I'm expecting that everybody know I'm a famous musician and then somehow come up and want my autograph or whatever it is. Um, a lot of people aren't going to know who we are. Okay? So clinging on to these kinds of identities really creates suffering. 
even sometimes clinging on to our nationality, you know, or our religious group, or our <coughs> ethnic group, and making these into inherently existent identities, that causes suffering. So we separate ourselves out from other people. So yes, there are distinctions, you know. One person grows up in one culture, one person grows up in another culture. But these are just relative conventional things. They are not our ultimate identity, you know, that delineate who we are in this universe. But if we hold them on to, hold on to them as if they were inherent identities, then of course we're going to be afraid of some people. And we're going to feel completely alienated from some people and unable to relate to some people. And these can be people that we've never even spoken to in our whole entire life, but because they cling on to one identity and we cling on to another identity, it means that we don't like each other, even though we've never met. When I was a little kid, I always wondered about armies and people who didn't know each other going and killing each other. You know? I was a kid saying, but they don't even know each other. So they haven't even done anything wrong to each other. So why are they so intent on killing each other? You know? I had that question as a kid. I still have that question. Yeah. So here you can see very, very clearly how clinging on to an identity creates a whole lot of suffering. Yeah. You see in, uh, you, you know, you can remember when Yugoslavia fell apart and, you know, became so many different little republics. And each group had their own identity. And on the basis of that identity, they hated other groups simply because the other groups were different and because maybe two, three hundred years ago their ancestors fought. Is that a good reason for us to kill each other today? Because our ancestors quarreled? But when we cling on to identities like this, then we develop all sorts of reasons why to kill other people, why to hate other people, because we make them different from us. Okay? If we really look on a conventional level, you know, who are we just conventionally? We're sentient beings who want happiness and don't want suffering. Does that describe you? Are you a living being who wants happiness and doesn't want suffering? Isn't that something that is much more fundamental about you than your nationality, your race, your religion, your occupation? Isn't that something that's much more fundamental? Because before we even had the idea of American, or white, or black, or, you know, Christian, or Jewish, or Buddhist, or, you know, nun, or plumber. You know, before we had all these identities, these false identities, you know, when we first came out of the womb, and all through our entire lives, Aren't we just a living being who wants happiness and doesn't want suffering? You know? When you strip everything away on a conventional level, that describes who all of us are. Okay. We're not a, we're not our career. And we're not the the people we hang out with or the place we go on vacation. We're just a living being who wants to be happy and doesn't want to suffer. And we can really feel that very strongly in our own heart, the truth of just being somebody who, you know, 
wants happiness, doesn't want suffering. And what's amazing is everybody else we look at in this room, that's the same truth about them too. Yeah. I mean, just look around in the room at all these other people. All have different bodies. You know, look at how many different people there are. Different hair colors, different ages. We don't even know about careers or socioeconomic status or any of that. No. But we do know that everybody we look at in this room that they want to be happy and they don't want to suffer. We know that about every single one of us. And when we look at animals <coughs> and insects, it's the same thing. They want to be happy and they don't want to suffer. That one might be a little bit new to you, you know. When you look at a grasshopper, you know, to think that grasshopper wants to be happy and doesn't want to suffer. What do you think? You think grasshoppers want to be happy and not suffer? They do, don't they? Because there's certain things that they try and do to stay alive. You know, they're really struggling to stay alive. They're struggling not to get eaten because they don't want to suffer. You know? So even grasshoppers want to be happy, don't want to suffer. Yeah. If you look at tropical fish, do they want to be happy and not suffer? And our pets, they definitely want to be happy and not suffer. And we want them to be happy and not suffer because we really pamper them. Go away, pets. So everywhere we look around, you know, there are living beings who want to be happy and don't want to suffer. What about George Bush? You think he wants to be happy and not suffer? Yeah. <laughs> think about it for a minute, you know, pull him out of whatever you the image you've created. Okay. A living being who wants to be happy and doesn't want to suffer. Yeah. If you're having trouble with the whole pre-election period and what's happening, look at the different figures involved and just think they're a living being who wants to be happy and they don't want to suffer. Instead of thinking, those beep, beep, beep. <laughs> yeah. No, they're just a living being who wants to be happy and doesn't want to suffer. Just like me. Okay. What about Osama bin Laden? You think he wants to be happy not suffer? So all these various people that were like the insurgents in Iraq. I'm not quite sure who the insurgents are. Does anybody know who they are? I mean, we just hear the insurgents did this and that, but I've yet to figure out who the insurgents exactly are. <coughs> but anyway, do you think they want to be happy and not suffer? What about the Taliban? They want to be happy and not suffer? What about the person who pumps your gas? Or the person at the bank? What bank? <laughs> <laughs> I used to be able to use that as an example. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, all these different people, you know, they're just wanting to be happy and not suffer. They may have diff different things that make them happy. The things that, may, that make them happy may not be the same <coughs> things that make me happy. But in terms of our wanting to be happy, we're exactly the same. Yeah. In terms of our not wanting to suffer, Again, some things may cause them suffering, they don't cause me suffering, and vice versa. But we still all want to be free of suffering. 
And on a physical level, I think we're all very the same, very much the same, in the sense that we all want to have food, clothing, shelter, medicine, and friends. And we don't want to be without those things, because that causes suffering. Okay. So when we look at it at a very, very basic le level, there's not really any difference between us and other people. And there's not much difference between people that we call our friends, people that we call strangers, people that we consider enemies. There's really not that much difference. Because they all want to be happy and not suffer. I do um, prison work. I, I never had an intention to do prison work, you know. And it's funny because the first inmate who wrote to me, you know, I got a letter from somebody who wanted some Buddhist materials. That was the first time. And he told me he sent out 25 letters to Buddhist centers, and I was the only one that responded. But when he looked at the list of centers and people he sent out his letter out to, I was not on it, and nor was the center <laughs> where I was at. So how I got his letter, I don't know. But we have a thing in Buddhism called the Bodhisattva vows. They're vows that you take that help you develop an altruistic intention. And so when somebody asks for help, if it's something you can help with, you say yes. You've taken a, a precept to do that. So there's no backing out. So somebody writes, you know, from prison and wants help, yes, I can do it, I'll help. And so I started doing prison work. What's interesting is over the years that a number of people have written me who have done the kinds of actions that most terrify me. Yeah. But as I write to them, I find out that they're human beings who are just like me who want to be happy and not suffer. And that, you know, we give people a label, like we give the people a label criminal. And in our minds, that means the sum total of their life, you know, the prominent identity is criminal. But when that person was five years old, are they a criminal? No. Every single moment they're alive and they're breathing, are they a criminal? No. But we give labels to people and then think that we forget that we gave the label and we think that they are the label. And that creates so much fear and separation. Whereas if you think living being who wants to be happy and not suffer, that's a much, that's a much more accurate description of who people are. So I've really seen through my work with inmates, <coughs> um, the sum total of a person's life is not one action that they've done. Human beings are very, very complicated, and I don't think we can say that the sum total of our life is one action. Do you? Would you want the sum total of your life to be one action that you've done? No. Especially if we think of the thing that we're, we feel worst about having done. Would you want everybody in the world to identify you according to that one thing that you did? Oh. No. Yeah. Why? Because we're human beings who want happiness and we don't want to suffer. Mm -hmm. And we're like everybody else. And so we train our mind repeatedly to see that in ourselves and to see that in everybody else. And it's uh, quite an amazing kind of transformation that happens inside of ourselves the more we train ourselves in that way. Yeah. 
So it means that you're stuck in a traffic jam and you're looking around at all the other people and you think, oh, they're just like me. They want to be happy and not suffer. You watch TV about the latest thing that the media is trying to make us terrified of and you look at all the different figures in it and you think they want to be happy and they don't want to suffer just like me. You look at somebody who's hurt you or somebody who you don't trust and you think they want to be happy and not suffer. There's not really much difference between us. <clears throat> so if we really tune in in that way to other people, then automatically whoever we meet, we feel a heart connection. Whereas if we establish an identity for ourselves and project an identity onto the other person, then even we just hear their name or see how they're dressed and we automatically feel like this, you know? So it all comes from our own mind. It all comes from our own mind. It doesn't come from the other person. And so that's why the more we can train our mind to see everybody as wanting happiness and not wanting suffering, then the closer will be able to feel to everybody else. Hmm? Very automatically. You know? It means you can be in a crowd and you feel connected to everybody in that crowd because you know something very important about them. They want to be happy and they don't want to suffer. They have feelings. They're real living beings with feelings doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether they're clean or dirty. Okay. It doesn't matter whether you approve of their actions or don't. Yeah. You still know something very important about them, and you can still connect on that kind of heart level. That's a very, very important thing. And so this is an interesting kind of reflection to do in the many situations that you find yourself in. Okay, so when, do it when you're in a traffic jam, when you're standing in <laughs> line somewhere. Okay, when you go to the polls to vote, look around. They all want to be happy and don't want to suffer. Yeah. When you look at the various people on TV, or see anybody in society, just you know, you go into a hospital or a nursing home or some kind of place where you don't go very often. And you just think that about the other people and automatically then you feel close to them. Something that's, that's quite beautiful. Okay. Another thing that we automatically know about other people <coughs> is that they've been kind to us. You're going to go, wait a minute here. Okay, I'm willing to concede they want happiness and don't want suffering. But you're going to tell me that they're kind. Yeah. You're going to tell me that the person who broke into my house and stole my stuff is kind. You're going to tell me that my ex is kind. You're going to tell me that Osama bin Laden is kind. You're going to tell me that, fill in the name of a certain political candidate, I will refrain myself, <laughs> is kind. <laughs> um, you know, all of a sudden we get a little prickly. Wait a minute, don't tell me that they've all been kind. Well, if we take a certain... A viewpoint on our life, we can actually see that they've all been kind. Okay? Um, so if we look just at, at this lifetime, the chair you're sitting on, do you know who made it? Do you know who designed it? 
Do you know who who the miner was that took the the uh, different minerals from the earth to make it? Do you know who the person was who invi invented the plastic backing to it? Do we know who it was who transported the chair here? Do you know who paid for the chair? We don't know any of that, do we? Yeah. And yet, we're sitting on a chair and we're benefiting from the labor of so many other living beings who made the chair and transported the chair. Think about it for a minute. You know, we're sitting on that chair and there's a lot of human beings' efforts and time and labor and kindness that has gone into the existence of this chair that I just stroll in this room, plop myself down into, and enjoy. And then you might think, well, I don't enjoy this chair so much. But think about how you would feel if you weren't sitting in it. Then you'd see that you really enjoy it, don't you? Yeah. If we had to sit on the cold floor, we wouldn't enjoy that very much. And if we go back, you know, just one chair, how many living beings' energy is in this chair? Yeah. So who are the people who worked at the PUD that produced the electricity that ran the sewing machine, that stitched together the fabric on the chair that I'm sitting on. Yeah? So think how many people in the PUD were involved in producing the electricity that ran the sewing machine. Incredible number of people. Because if you trace it back, then you have all these other beings who, I mean, starting with, um, what was his name, Ben Franklin? Who was the one, wasn't it? You know, this key in the kite? His mother. She told him not to get electrocuted. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so you, you start there, and everybody since then that's involved in the production of electricity people who built the dam, or the miners who got the coal, people who built the electric plant, and the wires, and, you know, so on and so forth. And that's just for the electricity, for the cloth, or the plastic that's stitched together on the chair. When you start looking at, well, what about the metal that's on the chair? And, you know, and who designed it? And you get all of a sudden into this incredible interdependent network of so many people on this planet whose efforts and creativity and energy were involved in producing the chair that we're sitting on. Because how many... You know, oh, the chair was made in a factory. Okay, so then we have to think about the, you know, the miners and, and the plastic people. But who built the factory? And who designed the factory? <coughs> so without that factory, we wouldn't have this chair. And who built the homes that the people who worked in the factory lived in? Because if they didn't have homes, they wouldn't have been able to work in the factory. And where did the material come from that built the homes of the factory workers? You know? And so as we go broader and broader and broader, we see how incredibly interconnected we are. We're so interconnected and we're dependent on the energies of so many people just to enjoy sitting on a chair for one hour. It's amazing, isn't it, when you think of it? Yeah. And then you start looking around in the room. Well, who made the carpeting? Yeah. 
and who made the table and who put in the lights and who made the heating system and who made the doors and the windows and you know and then of course the factories that produce those things and the homes of the factory workers and the people who made the homes you know and then their homes and so on and so forth and we see that we're very interdependent on so many living beings and that we don't know most of them yeah and so we're able to stay alive through the kindness of strangers and maybe even some of the people we don't like or the people we're afraid of were somehow involved in this interdependent network or web or net of people who enabled us to sit in this room and enjoy the evening together. Because yeah. You know, very soon, so many of the things we use weren't made in America, they're made in other countries. Yeah. So then we're so indebted to all the people in those other countries. And then it very easily spreads out. And so if we really think like that, then we'll see how much kindness we've received from others. Now somebody might say, but how were they kind? They didn't have the intention to benefit me. Does somebody have to have the intention to benefit us in order to be kind to us? Do they have to know you per personally and think, I want this person to be happy in order to be kind to us? No. Yeah. People don't have to know us personally. They don't have to have that intention. Because yeah. the bottom line is that we benefit from their labors. And so just that fact that we depend upon the labors of others just to stay alive means that they've been kind. And so that's also something to really think about as you go through the day, and as you encounter so many people in your life, to think they've been kind to me, that I've received benefit from their labor and their energy. And again, it's not just the people we see here, because so much of what we use was made in other countries by other people. So when you think like this, then our whole perspective really changes. And then when we say how to see ourselves as we really are, then we begin to see, well, we're just kind of an interdependent little bit of existence in this very, very interdependent world that is actually filled with a lot of kindness. And so often we don't see the kindness in the world. Because like I said before, the media thrives on making us afraid. But if you look, if you look in Missoula today, okay, if you think about how many people got hurt by somebody else today, and how many people were helped by somebody else today? Or how many people hurt somebody today and how many people helped somebody today? Wouldn't you say that there's much, many more people helping others than harming them? And wouldn't you say that there's much more help being received during the day than harm being received? And even if we look at our own life, because I'm sure we all have things to complain about today. We love complaining. But if we really look genuinely at our lives, yeah, didn't we also receive a lot of kindness?
did everybody eat something today? Okay, we all ate something. Did we grow that food that we ate? No. Yeah. Whatever food we ate came through the energy, the kindness, the effort of other living beings. And so if we start looking around, all the chairs we sat on today, all the things that we used, all the things that benefited us, you know, they're all related to other living beings. And so we received a lot of kindness today. And then there's a few things that happened we didn't like. <coughs> but compared to the amount of kindness that we've received from others today, the amount of harm is really comparatively little, isn't it? And so to dwell on that harm yeah, and make a big deal out of it is something that only makes us miserable. Whereas the more we train our mind to see the kindness in others, then the more our whole experience of living in this world changes. So the world hasn't changed. But we've changed, and so our experience of living in this world has changed. And then, of course, as we change, and we influence the people around us, then their minds change, too. It's contagious in a good way. Okay. So, it's... Time to end the video. Well, I'll open it to uh, questions and answers. Or I guess if you want to leave the video running, you can. We'll leave it on the web. Yeah, we'll just leave it on the web and people can continue <coughs> to watch if they want to. But I wanted to open it up to some questions or comments if you have something. Yeah. Honorable children, what's the good antidotes when you find your mind? assumptions and judgments. So what's a good antidote when you find your mind filled with opinions, <laughs> assumptions. assumptions, and judgments? Oh, that's a heavy one, isn't it? <laughs> opinions are bad enough. Add assumptions on top of that. <laughs> Plus judgment. <laughs> <laughs> We're drowning, aren't we? <laughs> We're drowning. Um, and I think there's a few different antidotes. One antidote is to ask ourselves, how do I know that's true? So we have an opinion. How do I know my opinion's true? But we have an assumption. We have a judgment. How do I know that's true? Because we could very easily see a situation from a totally different perspective and come to a different conclusion. That's one way to do it. Another way is just by being aware of the suffering nature of having opinions, assumptions, and judgments and shutting down the opinion factory. Because we've been taught to have a lot of opinions. From, I mean, even as little kids, what's your favorite color? You know, I was reading a story about a, a child who, who was Japanese and came to an American school and was asked, what's your favorite color, and didn't know what to say. <laughs> yeah? Because they don't teach you in Japan that you're supposed to have a favorite color. And... Who cares? <laughs> what, you know, did, is it important to have a favorite color? Is it important? Is it important to have a favorite kind of food? You know, a lot of these things that we've been taught to have opinions on are not things that are very important. And sometimes I think we get very confused by our opinions. I see parents in America saying to their, you know, their two-year-old kid, do you want orange juice or apple juice? How is a two-year-old kid supposed to know 
what they want, let alone what orange juice is and what apple juice is. And who cares? Why are we training our kids? Because, you know, when you ask the kids, you want orange juice or apple juice, the kid has to have an opinion. So then they have to think, well, what is going to give me the most pleasure, orange juice or apple juice? And so you're teaching your kid to look always at what's going to give me the most pleasure. Is that going to be an asset to your kid to always go through life looking at everything through the viewpoints of how can I get the most pleasure? That's going to be a hindrance to your child, isn't it? If they have so many opinions, because the more opinions they have and the, the more preferences they have, the more unhappy they're going to be because life doesn't fulfill all of our opinions and give us all of our preferences. Whereas if we're taught from the time we're little to be content with what we have, then we can go through life a whole lot happier than having so many opinions and preferences.